As someone who had unlimited streaming and cable access since childhood, the sitcom, the watching, and rewatching, and rewatching is a subject with which I am far too familiar, especially those that came out during and just before my childhood. In fact, reruns of Seinfeld were the white noise playing in the background as I wrote the script for this. In this essay, I want to focus on the changes and constants of 1990s and 2000s sitcoms, specifically the stylistic and thematic characteristics within the confines of them, rather than the behind-the-scenes business or regulatory element, or the real-life implications of these sitcoms' social influence. Nonetheless, I believe the evolution of situational comedies from 1990 to 2009, including more nuanced socio-political storylines, increased but imperfect diversity, and the rise of the anti-sitcom, reflects the social changes and consistencies in America during that period. As previously mentioned, I aim to divide the major characteristics of this period into two categories, continuity and change. In other words, I categorized them based on what seemed to be the natural progression based on trends seen in previous decades, and what seemed to be introduced as entirely unique in this era. From a historical lens, sitcoms in the 1990s moving into the 2000s saw a return to 1970s-esque counterculture and a willingness to normalize subject matter that would have previously been considered too risque for television. While some things were still off limits, Sitcoms proved to be increasingly open to alternative belief systems and lifestyles as time went on. In the 1990s, we saw a shift in how sitcoms addressed issues that began to surface in the 1980s. More often than before, sitcoms tackled relevant social issues more head-on, with more ambiguous complex moral takeaways and open-ended conclusions. The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air was famous for this mic drop style of letting an audience sit with a difficult plotline, whether that be systemic police brutality and racial profiling in episodes like Mistaken Identity, interracial relationships in episodes like Guess Who's Coming to Marry, or absentee parenthood in episodes like Papa's Got a Brand New Excuse. Friends was also praised for its unapologetic nature in tackling subjects like alcoholism, body image issues, fertility and security, suicide, and most clearly, unconventional family dynamics, as seen in Chandler's struggle to accept his father's gender identity, Monica considering single motherhood, Ross and Rachel raising a child out of wedlock, and most clearly of all, Carol and Susan's same-sex marriage. Another motion towards progress during this period was increased and stronger diversity in the stories being told. Friends, Sex in the City, Will and Grace, and, to a lesser extent, Seinfeld all had strong, single female leads. While networks couldn't shake the need for these women to be tethered to some kind of romantic subplot, these were three-dimensional protagonists who were not only career-oriented, but sexually liberated. The normalization of sexual subject matter in these series is also a progression worth noting. Although TV-14 still held its restrictions, mainstream programs like Seinfeld would regularly talk about intercourse from both a male and female perspective, famously devoting an episode, The Contest, to seeing which of their four main characters, including Elaine, could go the longest without masturbating. The episode cemented Elaine as, quote, one of the guys in the eyes of many viewers, On the topic of sexual liberation, Sex in the City, although an HBO series rather than a mainstream cable network, was a cultural phenomenon in itself. The series followed four single women in their 30s living in New York City who each have their own aspirations and views on sex and dating, narrated by Carrie through the lens of her sex-positive blog by the same name. The final, definite, continuous development in sitcoms moving into this period is the increase in, not only the frequency, but the quality of, representation for marginalized communities, primarily black and LGBTQ plus communities. In the 1980s moving into the 1990s, diverse voices on television definitely improved, not only because there was more, but because these characters were no longer shoehorned in walking stereotypes. Major networks were taking risks and greenlighting what would become iconic shows like The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, Martin, The Wayans Brothers, George Lopez, The Jamie Foxx Show, and Everybody Hates Chris. There was still an unspoken segregation, however. While there were more opportunities for shows with predominantly black casts to be picked up and stay on air, successful shows on major networks like NBC 
like Seinfeld or Friends, were still justly criticized for being, quote, too white, even by 1990s standards. Meanwhile, the increased queer representation in network sitcoms was the opposite, more integrated but less prevalent. As previously mentioned, Friends notoriously included Carol and Susan, one of the first long-term recurring lesbian couples on television. But as Friends was gaining popularity, Ellen premiered. One year after the titular Ellen DeGeneres came out both in real life and in the series two-parter The Puppy episode, making her the first openly gay lead on television to controversial audience responses, Will and Jack on NBC's Will and Grace paved the way for positive, proud, and widely accepted queer protagonists in comedy television. Although many of these important advancements blossomed from seeds planted decades prior, some of the most entertaining and fascinating elements of situational comedies in the 90s and 2000s had never been seen before, such as the rise of the anti-sitcom and the switch from three-camera to single-camera. I have always considered the anti-sitcom, similar to the modern notion of the anti-hero, to be television comedy that subverts the conventions of the sitcom format, often dark and depraved with unlikable protagonists and without a laugh track. On paper, it shouldn't work. The core of every successful sitcom is the charm of the sympathetic main characters and the shenanigans you follow them on and pray they get themselves out of. The anti-sitcom negates that notion, and while there is a charm to the atmosphere and situation, you aren't meant to sympathize with the characters. The anti-sitcom became popular in the early to mid-2000s, the prime example being It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, but I'd argue the subgenre can be traced back to Seinfeld. Every episode's plot found Jerry, George, Kramer, and Elaine in predicaments that they very clearly brought upon themselves, petty at best and felonious at worst. These characters were self-obsessed, neurotic, and delusional, premature, in a state of arrested development, a term that inspired a series of the same name in 2003. Arrested Development is an interesting case study, as the short-lived yet critically acclaimed series exemplifies another common theme in these anti-sitcoms, the dysfunctional family. As discussed earlier, subversion of the nuclear family trope was nothing new, but while the sitcoms of the 1990s explored a normalized, quote, alternative lifestyles, the anti-sitcoms of the 2000s had an obsession with dysfunctional family dynamics. Arrested Development, which could be described as a sort of proto-succession, followed spoiled siblings of inherited wealth and their incompetent parents, with the exception of the main character, Michael Bluth, quote, the one son who had to keep them all together. Malcolm in the Middle portrayed an explosive middle-class suburban family, four adolescent brothers and two parents under the same roof, through the eyes of the second middle child, Malcolm. It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, the quintessential anti-sitcom whose elevator pitch was essentially the anti-friends, includes these dynamics as well. The first season of Sunny followed four narcissistic friends, Mac, Dennis, Charlie, and Dee, who own an Irish pub in South Philadelphia, but spend more time hatching get-rich-quick schemes, abusing substances, and stabbing each other in the back than they do tending bar. However, most fans would agree the series didn't truly kick off until the premiere of season two, when Danny DeVito's character Frank was introduced as Dennis and Dee's affluent, neglectful father who buys the bar to become closer with his kids and voluntarily, quote, live in squalor as the fifth member of the gang. Thus, the dysfunctional family dynamic that was already present in Dennis and Dee's constant bickering as twin siblings is heightened, and after 16 seasons on the air, the always sunny family tree just gets stranger and stranger. Anti-sitcoms of the 2000s, like It's Always Sunny, Arrested Development, and Malcolm in the Middle, were some of the first to pioneer the crusade for single-camera television comedies with more naturalistic characters and dialogue, often handheld camera work and documentary-like editing, breaking away from the conventional three-camera sitcom format we had all been used to. It's Always Sunny hits nearly every mark I've outlined in my research. As previously established, the series uses a single-camera, handheld format, no live audience, no laugh track. It contains beyond risque and controversial subject matter, and complex, often negative, character dynamics between friends, enemies, and family members. But beyond that, the characters and stars of the series, Rob McElhenney, Charlie Day, and Glenn Howerton, set out to satirize every socially relevant and controversial topic since its inception in 2005 and in nearly every episode before they started to experiment with lighter or more absurd plots. 
These topics include, but are certainly not limited to, liberal racism, systemic racism, abortion, gun control, cancer, pedophilia, transgender relationships, class disparity, welfare, U.S. foreign policy, ableism, homophobia, transphobia, drug addiction, alcoholism, obviously, religious exploitation, bureaucracy, anti-Semitism, xenophobia, fatphobia, homelessness, and prison violence. That's just in the first two seasons. While some of the surface-level humor and language is outdated, the core sentiments of the show's most political episodes are radical even by today's standards. Sweet D is an independent female lead and maybe the least stereotypical of any series previously mentioned. While she is constantly belittled by the rest of the gang, D, you bitch, you bitch, you bitch, that cynical bitch, you gangly, uncoordinated bitch, keep singing, bitch. I got that stupid bitch. You lose the goddamn dumpster, you bitch. This is why we had to wait for you to go to Bed Bath and Beyond. Yes, bitch. Her storyline is never tethered to a love interest, but often her futile attempts to become a successful actress and comedian. Casting diversity has always been a weakness for the show, but Sonny's writing staff utilizes its historical lack of POC representation, among other shortcomings in the series, to open discussions about those issues and allow for humor in further emphasizing how awful the main characters are, rather than hiding their ignorance. One running joke and character arc throughout the show is Max's internalized homophobia. As a closeted gay man struggling to let his sexuality coexist with his religious beliefs and ideas of masculinity. The greatest risk in the show's history was the season 13 finale, Mac Finds His Pride, which ends in a seven minute long interpretive dance Mac performs to come out to his father in prison. No joke to release the tension, no subversion. One dramatic scene 13 seasons into an otherwise ridiculous comedy that spoke to and struck a chord with millions of viewers. Risks like that are what make these anti-sitcoms so unique. They break every pre-established rule of television and situational comedy for the sake of groundbreaking, breathtaking storytelling and art. Which is why we must analyze these stylistic and structural changes and when they happen, as minuscule as they may seem. Even if sitcoms are viewed as meaningless entertainment or unworthy of analysis or note in the general context of media history, comedy and television have remained the most common visual media consumed by the mass public for decades. That wide of a platform will always be influential, and we are more closely related to the diffusion and evolution of media as consumers than we give ourselves credit for. On a broad scale, I think it is certainly necessary for media creators to learn about sitcom history and how historical narratives are shaped. It is especially important that media creators expand their palette beyond their own experience or niche, otherwise progress will never be made. That was close.